The following sequence was assembled from material of varying quality, so do not adjust your set. Thank you one and all for sticking with us here on Time Space Visualizer. It's now my great pleasure to speak to an actor whose stories are very disproportionately affected by the missing episode saga. So please give your virtual round of applause at home for Mr. Peter Purvis. Peter, hello. Hi, what a wonderful round of applause. I'm, I'm very <laughs> appreciative of that. Thank you very I, much. I thought you might like that. I thought you might like that. You also got um, quite a large round of applause last week for uh, doing that wonderful story for us. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I mean, it's, it's only a short piece written by Gary Hopkins, and it, it yeah. was really very good indeed. I mean, I, I'm not saying my performance was. I, I just liked the story. When I when I first got it, I I, I sort of read it through. I thought, oh wow, this is this is spot on. I mean, it could be Stephen. I think it it sort of fits pretty well what I know about him. I don't know if he was married before. He yeah. went off. So where the panda came from, I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, but it could have come from a wife as a as a departing gift. But it was Absolutely. a good story, and I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed performing it. Good, good. Was it? Did did it feel a bit more uh, uh, space and breadth for the for the character in terms of? And I mean, have you found that with Big Finish anyway that that you get more to do? Well, yes, and I mean, I, I, according to uh, Simon Gary, at least on his, on the trilogy he wrote, which took Stephen on for three sessions after War to End All Wars and the Secret Room, or whether I can't remember the titles of all of them now. Um, and he, I think, yes. So Stephen definitely was married, got married at that time, and because he had children, because his daughter eventually became president or ruler of the of the planet that I relinquished the rule of. I mean, it was it was all fascinating stuff. I loved it. So uh, Gary, I think, hit that right on the on the nail. That was spot on. Good, good. And everyone loved it. And your, your performance, whatever you may or may not think of it, we loved it. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm flattered. Thank you very much. You can say all the nice things you like. <laughs> As I said at the top, your episodes are rather disproportionately affected by the, the number of missing stories that uh, that we have. And I mean, if we go from the top of your missing, we've got uh, we've got Galaxy 4, for which there's only only one episode anyway. I mean, what did you make of Galaxy 4 as a as a story? Well, I, you you know the the background to it. I I did not like it when I got the script. I was I was so disappointed with it because it was uh, it wasn't it wasn't written for Stephen. Mm. Uh, it, it had been written originally for uh, Jacqueline Hill and yes. as a vehicle for her, and I had to play her part. Because, I mean, the story, the, the, that particular story was passed and okay, and so that was what they were going to make. Mm. And the fact that Jackie and Russ had left and I'd taken over and our dear writer William Ems had not been told until later and had to adapt his script somehow. To, uh, so he had to keep the same story, but he had to give the part to me. Um, it made Stephen a bit weak, and so I, di I didn't like playing it. And I mean, it was a bad start because... Uh, John Wiles had just taken over as producer. Mm -hmm. uh, Verity had, uh, you know, she'd gone. And uh, the original story editor who had uh, written Stephen originally and told me what he was and uh, gave me the background to the character and everything, there was no sign of it in that story. And I, I, I found that very disappointing. So I fell out with John Wiles over that right at the very beginning. Not, a, not an auspicious start. Oh blimey! And of course, the the Chumbly is trundling about everywhere. Quite uh, quite a distraction, I think. Well, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, if you work, I mean, they're, they're wheeled, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it takes all the magic away, doesn't it? Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they were quite cute. I think it was rather hoped that they might be. Uh, a substitute for the Daleks yeah. and could come back in the future, but no, they they, they weren't interesting enough. It's a, it's a bit like the monoids from the chase, you know, they were not uh, not the monoids. What do we call mechanoids? The mechanoids, uh, yeah. 
And uh, they, uh, I mean, they were considered, they might be something. Of course, they had the disastrous final uh, battle with the Daleks and lost uh, on the planet that uh, I managed to escape from with the Doctor. It, yeah, it was, it, it's fascinating how it all evolves. But the, that Galaxy 4 story, no, I didn't like it much. I thoroughly enjoyed working on it mm. because uh, it was, well, it, it was... <laughs> The girls were great. I mean, there were four beautiful girls there. Yes. Um, and I always liked working in the company of very pretty girls, so that was nice. Yes. Um, but the, the character was not there for Stephen, and so I was very disappointed with that. And when the one episode was found, what was it, five years ago? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. May, maybe uh, longer, I can't remember. I was, I was happier with it then right. than I'd been before. Okay. Because I, I quite, I, I thought I did okay. I thought I performed it okay, and I thought the held the story held up well. It was rather silly. I mean, there the were things in the that one noticed that at the time we just accepted. But I mean, the, the, there was a, a a gate comes down uh, that stops the Doctor and Vicky going through it. Well, Vicky could have got through any of the gaps in it because it was a <laughs> flimsy piece of thing. And in fact, it wobbled so badly, I think they could have blown it over if they'd if they really tried. So, I mean, there are things like that that weren't very good. You know, a couple of uh, really not great shots, but I mean, everyone was working as live and everyone has to get it right. It's not just the actors who have to get yeah. it right. Mm, yeah, of course. The director has to have picked the right shots. I mean, Derek Martin has had a bad time with that the first two episodes uh, he had to stop tape and as you know from the interview with uh, Chris Barry on yes. Saturday uh, when he and Terence Dix were there um, it was it was almost a criminal offence <laughs> for yes. the director to have to retake of course. And we had to stop tape twice because his cameras got locked in each other's cables oh, and wow. sound couldn't get in. So, I mean, we had to stop to reset it. And he got everything in a total tangle. And that happened twice, first episode and second episode. So okay. it was an expensive thing. And it was one of Derek's very first television forays into uh, multi-camera television. Um and uh, he, he had to learn very fast. Episodes three and four were OK. And the, yeah. episode three, I think, is the one that was found. I, I mean, yes, episode three is one that was found. I mean, that's quite a, a baptism of fire, a, a, a mistake like that. I mean, it, it, the way you're describing it, Doctor Who sounds, and I've heard it described as such before, like a weekly rep. Uh, and then you're doing almost a live performance. Well, it's absolutely that. I mean, we, it was less than a weekly rep because we only rehearsed from Monday to Thursday True. and then we recorded on the Friday and that was it. Um, it yes, it was, it, was a, it was a tight schedule. But I mean, having been in weekly rep and spent two years there doing 96 plays, I was an awful lot of learning and throwing up. That was never a problem. Learning the script was not a problem. Getting it right really wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. And of course... You always expect, you know, people always want to know about the, you know, God, there must have been some hilarious mistakes. No. Yeah. We couldn't afford them. No. We had to get it right. And if there were mistakes, we had to keep going anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember on numerous occasions during a number of the serials, uh, whoever the companion was, certainly when, when it was Maureen, we yes. would be standing around waiting for Bill to get back on the script. Before we got our cue and we could carry on, and there, there was no escape. What do no. you do? You know? No, none, none at all. And Bill wasn't going to stop, even if he fluffed his way through it. He wasn't going to stop. <laughs> so, um, moving on to the next one that we have, and it's missing in its entirety, which is which is a shame. It's a shame that anything's missing at all. But the fact that something misses in its entirety, we've got the Myth Makers. Yeah. Um, again, quite a different story. You're looking at a, an historical. Well, we say historical, but you know, it's a it's a myth, isn't it? It was a myth. Um, so it's not really history, but uh, it fits into the category. The nice thing about the whole setup when I was in Doctor Who was that we did these historical stories mm. and they weren't science fiction. There was no, there weren't any monsters. There wasn't any sci-fi element in them. They were historical dramas. Yeah. And so we just played them. The opportunity to, to play them, because the TARDIS could get there, 
to a yep. particular place and time, then mm -hmm. we were in that historical situation. But we had great costumes and we did a costume drama. So, I mean, it was it was proper drama. It wasn't it wasn't really Doctor Who, if you like. I mean, the characters were there, but you, you know what I mean? Of There's, course. There was a difference. The science fiction was it totally irrelevant to it. Mm. it but the, the story could not have taken place without the sci-fi element. Uh, of course, of course. But in that case, it's a means to an end, isn't it? You arrive and then that's it. You're, you know, you're, exactly, you're playing exactly out the story. the, the, Those stories were just great to play. I mean, as soon as you saw the costumes, you went, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you put it on, I mean, an actor transforms himself when he gets into the costume. It, it just, it, may, it makes a difference. And yes. then you can start playing the part. So it was wonderful. And, and, and uh, the Myth Makers was like that. I mean, they were fabulous costumes, really good. Barry Ingham and I, we, we filmed at one of the very few locations I managed to film on. Right. <laughs> because we, we didn't. I mean, it was it was a studio-based show. Of course. Uh, we did inserts, which yeah. we would film. Uh, and I think I filmed on three locations in the whole of 46 episodes. Uh, French and Ponds of is course. where yeah. I fought uh, Barry Ingham, had the, the sword fight, and several mm -hmm. little sequences were, were filmed there. Um, Egham Borough Council Sand Pit is where we did the sand pit. <laughs> uh, I can't remember it. Oh, yes, we did. We did some location filming, and I can't think for the life of me why in the massacre. Uh, because I know we did that because Tony Lego was the cameraman, mm. and he was Paddy Russell's partner, who was the director. Yeah. Uh, and they worked together on that. And we, we, we filmed somewhere, somewhere in Surrey, and I can't remember where or why. Mm. I can't remember the sequence even. So that's different. But those are the only times. Apart from that, we did a few inserts at Ealing. Yeah. It was quite nice going down to Ealing Studios to do bits, but they were very little bits. You know, in um, the Dalek Master Plan, another mm -hmm. one that's mainly missing, mm -hmm. uh, we bounce around on trampolines for a nice slow motion sequence of floating in space and that sort of thing. But I mean, that's it. Oh, and the art. We yes. did we did uh, some filming there with the animals, or having the elephant and the snakes and the stuff in in the jungle. That was Absolutely. all that tickling. Uh, but apart from that, everything was studio based. Yeah, yeah. I, you mentioned the the historical and the the costumes and those sorts of things. I mean, that's something the BBC always did and still does excel Absolutely. at. I think I think it was Daphne Dare who was the the costume designer. Mm -hmm. For the show, because I mean, they, she got it absolutely right, and those costumes were stunning. Thanks to uh, Clayton Hickman's colorization of my favorite photograph of all of the pictures, me and Bill in the tavern in the, the massacre, and Clayton Hickman did this wonderful colorization. I asked him to actually, I, yeah. I seen him, he, he colored the the uh, a press photograph actually in black, it had never been in color, yeah. uh, in black and white of me, Bill, and Maureen looking over a rock in the, in the time meddler. And he yeah. cut that. And I thought, oh, that's clever. I want, could you do my favorite picture, mm -hmm. please? And he asked for a, a, an indication of the colors. Yeah. And I get, I told him precisely what it was, sort of slightly orangey red or a sparkly, you know, a nice m muted red, but it had an edge to it. Mm. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the the blue tie that uh, that Bill wore, and he came up with that fabulous colorization. So thanks to that, uh, people can actually now see mm. just how good the costumes were. But I can't tell you how good the others were. You know, in the, when we were doing the scenes in the tavern with a great great cast. I'm jumping ahead, aren't I? I'm going to no, that's fine. That's fine. So, I mean, it's fabulous. And, 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 and of course, where we started, we were talking with the myth makers. That was terrific. Mm. One of the costumes on that, I, <laughs> which is really quite amusing, I suppose. Do you ever see uh, Carry On Cleo? Oh, yes. Well, Francis, Felix DeWolf, Francis DeWolf, who played the ship's captain in Carry On Cleo, Yes. He played Agamemnon in The Mythmakers. The Mythmakers, yeah. Same yeah. costume. He wore the same costume. Now, I never realised that. Yeah. How wonderful. It's, the, an, it's gonna... the identical costume. It was his costume in Carry On Cleo, and he wore it on, uh, on Doctor Who. So How I got funny. double airing. <laughs> That's good. That's obviously, yeah. you know, yeah. recycling but and reusing is what it's all about. 
Yeah. As you mentioned, you were talking about the historical things having, you know, mm. being, being a good thing to act. Now, we have this terrific cast, you know, we've got Max Adrian, who was just oh. a wonderful man and, and, and a beautiful actor. I mean, he was just so good. And he played King Priam. We had Barry Ingham, who played Paris. We had Ivor Salter, who played Menelaus, most menacing face. I mean, absolutely yeah. superb. I knew him quite well because I played cricket with him. There was a... Oh. Uh, a team called the Television Travellers, and I, I played with them. He, he was he, he was there, so I played with them a few times. Um, and uh, of course, Francis the Wolf, who was just uh, he was great fun. He didn't get on with Bill. Didn't like Bill. Oh, um, really? No, no. Uh, Bill was was struggling with the script. He couldn't say Agamemnon properly. Mm. He always mumbled it. You know, he said, "No, no, uh, listen to me." Yeah, King uh, Edgar Mimini, and it would pull <laughs> off his way out of it. Uh, and he he was being particularly bolshy. He didn't like the director, right? Was Michael Leeson Smith, mm. who I thought was lovely, lovely yeah. man. But he was odd. He would turn up to rehearsals, uh, uh, the, the the week's rehearsal each time, and he'd be wearing jodhpurs and riding boots, and he'd have a cowboy hat. <laughs> And he was a bit like um, von Stroheim, you know. <laughs> That's quite something. That's yeah. it. But but it was because as soon as we finished rehearsing, he went to Richmond Park to play polo. That was what he did. He, his oh. hobby and all his money went on two polo ponies. And that's where he, he used to go off and he used to play polo. And so he would turn up at rehearsal in the kit ready to go and play. Yeah, that's that's quite an expensive uh, hobby. So yeah. I think I think he had about two families as well to look after. So that was all. Always <laughs> it's it's holy, it's he, was, he was a nice guy, and he got. Yeah, I think he did a very good job on it. Most people will never know because we'll never see it. But if you listen to the audio, it's a pretty good piece. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it is. It, it's, it's kind of full of life and pace. And uh, you said that you said there um, that we'll we'll never see it. Is that your feeling on the, the oh, missing episodes now? I don't think we'll see it anymore. I remember Philip Morris said he hinted mm. some years ago to me that there was some good news in the pipeline. Right. Um, it might have been the episode of Galaxy 4, but it, I don't think it was. I, I believe they had found some cans which should have been either either the Myth Makers or the Massacre. And I'm not sure which, but I believe that it was not restorable. It wasn't, uh, they couldn't do anything. One well, of my dog's in the background there. He's uh, feeling penned in. I've stuck myself here in, in, my, in my office and uh, he's, he's a bit fed up. So if you hear occasional barks and grizzles in the background, Bertie? it's entirely understandable. Entirely <laughs> understandable. I've got two cats running around somewhere, yeah. feeling much the same, much the same. But then we're all locked in. I mean, how are you doing? Are you is is everything all right with you? I should oh, have we're, asked. We're we're in lockdown, but uh, we're in a very quiet part of the country, mm. and it's not much different from normal, except I don't go out. Yeah, yeah? it's. Uh, I'm, I don't go to the shops. We've got some uh, very nice neighbours who do some shopping for us. And uh, actually, I do go out. I went to the butchers uh, today, but that's yeah. uh, about a six, seven mile drive. And I, I went out there. And they've got a click and collect. And you just send an order in, and it's there for you outside. And pop it in the back of the car and come. You don't meet anybody. No, of course. Um, so yeah. I just no, I'm, I'm sort of isolating myself, playing, playing safe. We're all we're all having to adapt. All so, in the same uh, boat. All in yeah. the same boat. Yeah, there's no hence, escape hence speaking to you this way rather than uh, face to face. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, now let's move on to the the colossal beast that that was and is Dalek's master plan. <laughs> um, I mean, what what did you think when you were first presented with this this twelve episode <laughs> monster? I I wasn't looking forward to it because I, I found the Daleks. I'd, I'd met them, of course, in uh, when I, I I played Morton Dill and in the last episode of the uh, of the chase. But um, I I didn't really. Yeah, you know, they were a nuisance in the studio. It was, it was a bit boring. 
Mm. The, the magic's gone um, because you know you see the they're working with the tops off, so yes, <laughs> you yeah. just see a guy sitting in a thing that they trundle around the place, and that's the rehearsal. Mm. Um, the thought of 12 weeks was a bit, oh dear, but it varied. It went through quite a lot of different phases. There was a nice True. sci-fi bit at the beginning. We got Katarina there up until she was thrown out of the, mm. of the, uh, the airlock. Um, yes. And then we got, and it was a worrying time as well. I, I, I should say that from the start. We just lost Maureen. Maureen O'Brien had been yep. unceremoniously dumped, really. Um, apparently... I, th I believe John Wiles had heard on the grapevine that she wasn't happy with the part and all that. But she'd gone away for a summer holiday and she came back. We got the scripts of the Myth Makers mm. and found that she, she discovered then that in episode four, she was out of the show. So she discovered when she, that was the first she knew of it was yeah. when she read the script. Yeah. Oh, that, that's how it, it's, it often happened like that. I'll tell you, there's another that happened to me. Wow. Later. Oh. Um, so she had four episodes uh, notice of the fact that she was leaving the show. Wow. Uh, because of the upheaval with me and John Wiles over the Galaxy 4 scripts, mm. I didn't feel all that secure there either. Mm. Um, and when we started the Dalek Master Plan and we got Nick Courtney there for yep. certainly the first four episodes, and we didn't have the whole scripts, we didn't have 12 scripts, uh, I think we had two, then two, then, I, I mean, it was, right. that's the way it went. Um, I was very relieved when along comes uh, Gene Marsh, the Sarah Kingdom, and kills Brett Vyer and Nick yep. Court, because I thought Nick was there to replace me. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was that kind of time. It was that uncertain, was it? Well, it was, and you can see why, because Katarina was expected to be the girl. Yep. She went out through the airlock. Sarah Kingdom's there. She was expected to be the girl. Well, and we knew she couldn't be because she had another job to go to. So in in, in the final episode, she had to depart. Yeah. And in fact, they made certain she couldn't come back because they turned her into dust. Indeed. Uh, Indeed. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, it was it was very interesting. In that there were nice things in the master plan. I mean, some good acting to do. I enjoyed yeah. that. Kevin Stoney, I thought, was fantastic. And, of yeah. course, we had the, the absolute bonus that we got Peter Butterworth back yes. to play the, the meddling monk again. Absolutely. Uh, to get in the way for two episodes when we were in ancient Egypt. I mean, it yes. was a real mishmash. And, and don't forget the Christmas episode. Yeah. I mean, yes. the, the Feast of Stephen, we, there was a piece of nonsense. We went to Hollywood. We had we had the Keystone Cops. We had bun fights, you know, uh, custard pie fights. Crazy. And yes. at the end, Bill breaks the fourth wall and says, Merry Christmas to all our viewers. Oh, it's madness, absolute madness. But I mean, we didn't see that coming. That just happened. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, that's the least likely of all Doctor Who episodes to turn up because it well, was never it was sold. It was never sold anywhere. It was never sold anywhere. Never I'll sold anywhere. You, I'll tell you something else about I thought nothing of mine was ever sold anywhere. So they should have still had it. In mm -hmm. cans, nicely stored, because ah, of the, yes. the, the telecine when they wipe the tapes. Um, but uh, no, I, I was never aware that we sold them anywhere because I didn't receive one royalty ever in the time I was in the show. And it was a long time afterwards, a long, long time afterwards, maybe in the 90s, that I first got a royalty for something like the Ark. Wow. Don't tell me that they didn't sell them. They did, but they never paid money. Good grief. That's quite something. I've, I would never, not... I've never taken that up, but I, I think that we were cheated. It certainly sounds See, that we way. We know that they were being sold around the world. Mm. And they like doubt them. they were sold around the world. I think they sold them to the, the uh, public broadcasting channel, PBS in the States. No, we wouldn't get much money for that, if anything. But I didn't get anything, not one penny, not ever. Well, certainly um, Arabic. I know that there's a there's a great book that covers it, but certainly some Arabic countries, because there's a there's a rather interesting excerpt of, a, of an episode um, I, off the top of my head. Can't remember which, but it is. It's Bill Hartnell. Um, 
talking away dubbed over in, in Arabic. So, so really? it certainly, yes. it certainly went went to, to quite a few places, which is yeah. of course where some of these some of these returns come from. I mean, do you remember when the Day of Armageddon um, episode turned up again? I mean, I guess by that point you had given up hope of seeing any of it ever again. Sorry, which was Day of Armageddon? From from the Daleks' master plan. Um, it's a very it's it's the one that turned up most recently from from that. But I mean, that said, we're only left with episodes two, five, and ten anyway. Yes. And, yeah. You know, like you say, we. I've never seen it. That one. What's, what, oh, worth a worth a watch. Worth, a, worth yeah. a watch. And you talked about colorizing earlier. I know that. Um, I know that a, a little team have, have have got together, and that's now that's and is now that the one in, that they've colorized. They've colorized in in, oh, in wow. full color. Well, I was, so. was going to go to a showing of that this month, but that's gone. Uh, it was being shown as a charity thing to raise money for the previous disaster, which were the fires in uh, in Australia. Absolutely, absolutely. I was due to be there myself, so I would have seen you there. Fingers crossed, we'll. That will be a very nice Fingers crossed, it'll be a postponement, and we can see it then. Yeah. Um. So that's the the Daleks' master plan. Um. We talked about the massacre. All four, all four episodes missing, which is a shame, given what you've said about uh, the historicals and the costumes, that we don't have that beautiful visual record of those episodes um, anymore. Yeah. And in fact, my my memory of it is. It's quite, it's, it's, it's a bit scant, really. Mm. I don't, don't have a, a strong memory of, of us doing it. I know it now because, I mean, I, I, it all, all these things came back to me when Mark Ayres asked me to do the commentaries on the BBC audio collection. Yes, which yes. has all of the original soundtracks recorded by our friend whose name escapes me in uh, uh, in Croydon, who yes. stuck a microphone in front of an old television set and recorded all Absolutely. of the audio. So, I mean, none of it would exist if it wasn't for him. Mm. And when Mark asked me to do those, I was listening to, to scripts that I hadn't heard in 40 years, 35 years when we did those. Uh, and it was all new to me. Like, what? Of course. Did we do yeah. that? I don't yeah. remember. I mean, it was that was uh, that was what it was. The massacre I thought was absolutely fabulous. I've always liked it. I, I know I enjoyed performing it. I know that I had a pretty substantive role in it because it was it was written very much as a vehicle for me. I mean, there's some good stories about that because John Lucarotti, who wrote, came up with the idea. Uh, and had the script commissioned yeah. that script is not what went on the screen the, the script that went that was actually filmed was largely written by donald tosh right he was the story editor he rewrote it um because basically it couldn't be filmed now it couldn't be filmed for a number of reasons uh and there were i mean there was certainly a certain amount of acrimony between donald and uh, uh, John Lucarotti about it. Um, but John also wrote the novelization of it, which I've recorded, yes. um, which is fascinating because it is so different from the audio that goes that goes out. Yeah. But there, there was a, in the book, there's all these uh, under subterranean passages in Paris where dog carts get raced along like chariots. Right. Um, doing various bits, I mean, all sorts of stuff, which we, t we couldn't have filmed that. That no. was just impossible back in the day with the technology that we had and the limited budget, it just mm. couldn't have been done. They made up for it with fabulous costumes and great actors. We had Leonard Sachs there, Andre Morel, um, uh, Eric Thompson, Christopher Tranchell, Annette Robertson. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a really good piece. And of course, there's another example of someone coming out, you know, as, as being the next girl. Everyone would have thought Annette was going to be it. Yeah. She did four, four episodes, and but at the end, no, it couldn't be her. And they brought in Dodo. They brought in uh, Jackie Lane. Mm -hmm. So you, it was a, it, that, that, <laughs> thinking about it that way, it's a, it really was an insecure year of my life mm. once i had a secure job for a year well i didn't know it was secure uh, i did have that job for a year uh, it was a very insecure time you always thought the the writing was on the wall and you were going to be thrown out 
I, it, it, it sounds pretty unsettling from, from where <laughs> I'm standing, I have to say. Um, talking of costumes and colours and all sorts, uh, this next story um, that has three episodes missing, The Celestial Toymaker, um, we, are, we have the, at least the benefit of this, that we have some wonderful colour behind the scenes photographs, which gives a real feel for the thing. Well, it was it, it was it was great. I mean, that was a terrific story, a great script. Now, I didn't know at the time that Bill was on holiday because they were also experimenting on seeing could the show work without the Doctor. Right. Um, and so it was written for me and Dodo to carry it through playing the games with all these wonderful other characters that came along with the toy maker and the costumes were sensational mm. absolutely sensational uh, michael goff's costume as the toy maker oh fantastic uh, my costume with that wonderful jersey <laughs> uh, which i absolutely hated um i didn't think dodo's costume was all that good either for that matter but the red uh, black with it yes the, yes yeah, with red the but the other costumes, the Billy Bunter character, the clowns, um, the the cook, the secret, yeah. the 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 king queen of hearts. I mean, it, it was it was wonderful. It was very colourful, and those games were terrific. Now, I don't think something like the Crystal Maze would have happened if it hadn't been for the Celestial Toy Maker. Mm -hmm. And I know that my colleague from Blue Peter, Leslie Judd, did the series which I can't remember what it was called now, but it was it was people doing those games. The adventure game. The adventure game. There you go. That's it. Yeah, and that yeah came very, very similar. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it was good fun to play. And uh, and we had the we had the parts. Uh, Jackie and I had great parts to play. And the games were good. I believed in the games. And Bill, well, I mean, he, he filmed at Ealing to get him to disappear in the hand and yes. then all that stuff, the, the disembodied hand was all that was there of Bill and uh, apart from the beginning and the end really. Um, so it, it was it was a wonderful piece. It was a very cleverly thought out piece. And I, th I think it worked extremely well. I think it did. I think you're right about, this is the adventure game, by the way. It is available oh. on, on DVD. So there we are. That's why I knew it quite well. I have it. I, yes, have, I yeah, have this. Yeah. So it's all on there. And of course, Leslie did, Leslie did a whole series of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, but you're you're quite right, and and a, and a beautiful visual thing. Um, did you think it could have worked without Bill, the the program? I, it, it never occurred to me. No. I I the funny thing is I wasn't really aware that there was anything different. It was, all right, it's just another story, and in this I've got a bit more to do. It's, I, that's all. It was the same with the with the massacre. Yeah. Because Bill, you know, although he played two parts in that, he wasn't on screen a great deal during it. Uh, and Stephen really led the piece. Mm. Well, I didn't have to lead it because uh, there were other some really superb actors around me. Uh, and it's a great story. So there was nothing to carry. It was just there. It was, you know, it was all laid out. Talking of superb actors, of course, with the just going back to the celestial toy maker, you had Michael Goff and you've got Carmen Silvera, of course. Yes, yeah, Peter Lawrence. Uh, mm. uh, oh, oh dear, um, can't remember. Mustachio, lovely, lovely man. Um, forgotten his name. This is where you need Toby Haydock and not me. <laughs> oh, Toby, Toby would know absolutely everything. <laughs> There, I mean, there are a lot of people who do. When I go to, when I first went to a convention, people were asking me questions about various bits of script, and I hadn't a clue. I don't know what they were talking about. Did I do that? I had no idea. I mean, now I've heard them all and listened to the audios, um, which I I don't do on a on a regular basis. I think <laughs> I the last. I don't think I've listened to. The savages since I did the audio. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, why would you? Unless I, I can't imagine a, a, a night at the, a Saturday evening at the Purvis household where we're sitting down and so listening no, to the savages. No, no it's not going to happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, so, no, I, I'm, I'm, that was then. Yeah. But I, I am pleased that it's, that it's, um, it's remembered nicely. I'm pleased that people liked it. And they liked the fact 
that at least the, the missing stories exist in some form. Uh, but it, it, it's, just, it's very strange, really. I mean, be, being an actor and looking back at things that you've done, um, that's nostalgia, and I don't really do nostalgia. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That's fair. Um, then maybe we won't be getting nostalgic about The Savages, but uh, there's, there's actually very little to get nostalgic about. All four episodes are missing again. So this is your swan song. Um, you mentioned earlier that you, again, you didn't know it was going to be your swan song and, until you got the script. Is that right? That's right. Uh, Innis Lloyd had taken over as producer. He'd been introduced to us as the new producer mm -hmm. uh, during the last episode of uh, The Gunfighters. Do I mean the gunfighters? Yes, I think the savages are so. gunfighters. Yeah. Um, and uh, Innis came along and we got the script for the savages. And he said, oh, you'll note, you'll see in episode four that we leave you on a planet. I'm afraid we're not renewing your contract. And that, that was, was it. That, that was it. I think, I, think they were, I think that was slightly kinder than uh, what they did to, uh, to Jackie. Because Jackie yeah. went without even a, a proper exit. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. That's not not really the way you. Um, it's not you, the way you, you do treat it. your actors. It's what I mean, we talked about a, a brief bit of uh, location filming for the Savages. Yes, Egan um, Council Sandpit. Wonderful location. <laughs> uh, Wonderful location. Do and you have a I mean, director? Yeah. Good, good. Do you um, have much in the way of memories of, I mean, the story-wise, it's like you say, you've not heard this in a long time. Did you feel it was a fitting end for Stephen? Um, oh, yes. In, in retrospect, yes. I was, I was very, very annoyed, very, very upset yeah. that, that it just came to an end like that. And no reason given. I mean, it wasn't a question, you're no good in the show. No, no one ever said, the, the, uh, sorry, you're not really up for it. You're not good enough. That wasn't the reason. Um, they just wanted a change. Innis Lloyd gave the rather fe feeble uh, reason that uh, companions are only going to stay with the doctor for one year. Yeah. Well, all right. I stayed for a year. Nobody else did. Apart from, I think, Michael Craze and Hanukkah may have. Mm -hmm. May okay. have. Uh, but then uh, along came Fraser and stayed yeah. for. I, I was going to say, I can't get rid of I think, him. I think Fraser still, would probably he's still probably be still in it somewhere. <laughs> would you rep. go back? I mean, would you go back to the program as it stands now? What to play an old Stephen? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'd love that. Mm. Mm. I'd love that. I, I I would. We need to have a. We need to. Have a, <laughs> we need. BBC, listen to us. We we need I, Stephen. I, back. I've, I've said it. I said it to Stephen Moffat when we uh, w when uh, we met at the uh, BFI in uh, Cardiff to see yes. the uh, episode of Galaxy Four when that was rediscovered, and also one of Fraser's episodes as well. And yeah. I said, uh, you know, I think there's you know there could be a really good story in there. Mm -hmm. Stephen Moffat, he, 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 I don't think he knows I exist. <laughs> <laughs> Moffat. Um, however, it's not uh, there, so it doesn't bring, matter. Oh, this is true. This is true. Um, and bringing it bang up to date, although you weren't involved in the production itself, I know that you've been uh, quite the champion and cheerleader for the Mission to the Unknown uh, remake by U Clan that happened uh, last year. Yes, I, I, I mean, people think I was heavily involved in this. I wasn't. No. Uh, Andrew Ireland, who directed it, uh, got in touch with me to say it was happening. And would I be interested in, in seeing what they were doing? Mm -hmm. and I, I, I'd be absolutely thrilled. So he invited me to go up to Preston, to the university, and to be there on the day of the, 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 the when they shot, the, they did the first bit of shooting for it. Okay. it a three-day three shoot was planned for it. Um, and so I, I jumped at that. I thought that was terrific. And on the train going up from uh, uh, up to Preston, mm. I tweeted the fact that the following day I was going to have something that was going to interest Doctor Who fans considerably. I remember uh, it well. That's been missing <laughs> for a long time. They would like to hear some news about it. And that Twitter went potty. Uh, and 
So the following day, I was able to announce what it was, as well as it was announced on, on television and everything. Yeah. So there was a big, big splurge with it. So I saw that being done, and I thought it was superb. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I walked into and shown all the, the studio props. I was shown the Varga plant, which, and the original drawings that they had. But that's all they had to go on, plus the audio, which we've yes. been talking about the yeah. audio. So they had the audio for it. So they knew how it should time. They know what the script was because they had the script. Um, They knew what it should look like from the original photographs and drawings of the set and and bits, and they recreated it. When Edward D'Souza walked into the the studio where the rocket ship was in the jungle, Sorry, this chair's squeaking a bit. That's quite funny. Um, when he walked into, he all, he was almost tearful because he said, "That's oh, wow. it. That's it. It's exactly it's, right." It was accurate. So it, for him, it was a, a, a trip back in time. Right. And I think Marco made a great fist of the character as well. Oh yes, he made oh, it very yeah. well. Andrew's direction was splendid. He had pretty good equipment. Mm-hmm. Far better equipment than we had back in the day, yeah. but he didn't use it like it could be used. So he didn't try and update the way it was presented. He used the same techniques. Yeah. Back in the day, we didn't have zoom lenses. So if you wanted a close shot, and you, you've got a nice wider shot here, mm. and the next shot on the same camera is going to be a close shot, the camera has got to turn a turret a handle on the side which turns a turret which puts a different lens there and gives him the closer shot. Or he wants to get in close, the camera has to move in. Physically push it in. So wow. that was the way that's how they shot it. Yeah. They did all the shots. They knew how long they should be. They have nothing nothing to judge it by other than this is the set that they had. These are the words. This is what it looks like. Yeah. These are the right things. Now we'll shoot it. And he, I think he did a superb job on it, Andrew. And uh, uh, yes, it, it, well deserving of the praise it has had. Yeah, I'm absolutely right. Now he'll do the massacre. Ah, fingers oh. crossed. Fingers, <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, Peter, it's been absolutely wonderful, wonderful to talk to you. Um, I do hope that we get to chat face to face sometime soon and this, this all comes to an end. Yes, that would be nice. That would be nice. I mean, uh, if for nothing else, you, you, you can we meet the fans and uh, we can sign some pictures for them. And, you know, it's it, it, it's it's a, a pleasurable occasion. But yeah, I've enjoyed it. Is. I, I mean, it's, it, it's very nice. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, that, that possibly I've given some people a little bit of insight into what it was like uh, working on those lovely episodes that they're missing. It was a good, it was a good time to work in television, you know, mm. the sixties, seventies, early eighties, before they got that sort of multitude of additional channels that haven't really improved the genre at all. <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's still plenty of good television. There was plenty of good television then. Yeah. There's plenty now, but I don't think there's very much more good television. There's just more television. There's more space but for advertising. There's more more space for advertising, more space for more rubbish. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the good television, it's still there. And it we is, still it find is. it, luckily. It's still, you, we, we still see it. Um, but, um, yeah, the proliferation of channels, I don't think, is, was a particularly wonderful move. Nor do I. So to that to that end, and without meaning to sound as if I am contradicting you, I hope you are entirely wrong and that all of your episodes turn up again oh. somewhere. That would be uh, that would definitely be Christmas come early, particularly, of course, if the Feast of Stephen turns up. That would be the cake on the cherry or the other way around or the cake on the cake. Even it would be fantastic. Absolutely right. Well, listen, thanks ever so much. It's been lovely to talk to you. And uh, you thank you time space visualizer and in time space visualizer fashion everybody at home please give a huge round of applause for the brilliant peter purvis thank you peter thanks andy thanks everyone for watching hope you enjoy the rest of it